Hey everybody, I asked you to do a final summary and it seemed only fair that I should do one as well. So uh, I would like to first of all thank you. Uh, I can't believe the speed of this class and you all kept up. Uh, <laughs> it's been pretty amazing. Sadly, we lost a couple along the way because of problems with their job or their family, but I've never really had a class that did as an amazing job as this particular group did in not only keeping up and getting your work done so that we could move through the class materials, uh, but in actually maintaining the quality of your work. So I'm, I'm very appreciative. Thank you so much for that. Um, I want to talk briefly about some things that I just want to share with you because semester is over and we only have so much time to cover stuff and there's just a few things that I wasn't able to fit into the class. Um, I'm not going to lecture, but I do just kind of want to tick through some topics and hopefully give you some resources so you can actually look up some of these things if you're interested in what I'm mentioning. So first of all, uh, we discussed the importance and the value of bringing a diverse uh, group of stakeholders into the conversation um, and to bring all of the different members of community, no matter who they are. Uh, but what we didn't talk about at all, is kind of like, well, what do you do when they get there? Uh, we didn't discuss the phenomena of power or what happens when there are so many cooks in the kitchen and cooks who cook very different uh, styles, right? I do not think any of you will be surprised if I tell you that the best tool is storytelling. The important thing is to remember that even though it takes a long time, it is important to make space to give everyone an opportunity to actually tell their story about whatever subject matter it is that brings all the people into the room. Um, when I have facilitated multi-party conflict um, issues, we basically set up an entire week, how many hours it takes to go around the table and let everybody say, this is why I am in the room. This is how this topic impacts me and the people I represent. These are our fears and these are our, uh, at, these are the things that we are excited about. And basically uh, share themselves, share their the river of their group's journey, if you will. I think that what happens when people not only uh, understand your story, uh, but they're able to begin to empathize with the considerations of each of the folks around the table. And it begins to build community and build understanding and build trust. And when that happens, all the partners tend to, as they are brainstorming solutions and thinking about the problems, they tend to um, take into consideration not just their own needs that they walked into the room with, but the needs of the people in this new little community. And the, in the way that I uh, attempted a little bit to help us bond as a classroom community, uh, it's, a, it's a bigger job, but um, when there are so many diverse voices in conflict, but it's important to begin to build the community. I think you saw that in the Holding Ground movie. Um, in all the ways that they brought people together to be social and to have opportunities to tell their story, it is so time consuming. And if you think about the one reality of uh, the Dudley Street experience is that it took years, right? Um, and yet those years invested were really well spent because what came out of them was amazing and durable and truly represented the needs of the community. By the way, there is a follow-on movie for Deadly. <laughs> Their conflict did not end and new players came in and so forth. Um, and uh, you can look it up. It, it, just go to uh, Google and pull up, you know, the rebirth of Dudley Street uh, uh, sequel and it will pop up. I think it may also be available to you through a, through Canopy at ASU, but if it's not, I think you'll be able to find it and it's kind of fascinating. And um, the fact that the conflict continued as time went on and new leadership and uh, new needs emerged and whatever is a great segue into the next thing that I, I want to tell you. Um, and that is that uh, the second problem has to do with shared leadership, the second challenge that I want to raise. Um, it's hard to share leadership, especially if you're seriously invested um, 
when new leaders come in to join you, on the one hand, you're thrilled because the stick's in a bundle, right? The more people are on board, the more likely you're gonna get your work done. On the other hand, it begins to mean conflict about how to move through things and how to process. And so two things I wanna say. Uh, one is you sometimes have to stop and go back through the storytelling thing all over again. Um, because people who came in later did not hear what happened in the beginning and you can't just expect them by osmosis to adopt things that have already uh, been adopted without knowing why and knowing where it came from. The other thing is I want to just tell you a little story um, and I think this will just maybe help you a little bit when you are facing this in your own uh, situations at work. In 2015, I was asked to facilitate the rebuilding of a really important community organization that had existed once, um, but its structure wasn't stable and it didn't serve the community in a sustainable way and it failed. And it wasn't about money, it was about power. Um, but the organization was very unique in what it did. There was no other organization filling that niche and the community wanted to rebuild it, but in a different, less political, more sustainable way. So they asked me to do this and I was very honored actually and kind of surprised, but uh, I took it on and I built this out in stages. I started by pulling together a very small advisory group of people who were interested and um, at every step along the way, they informed uh, what we were doing and I wasn't, you know, trying to work on it myself, but I knew that this organization had to represent the community. And so I built this organization in stages and at the appropriate stage after we had, you know, talked through what we were doing there and what our hopes and our vision and our mission were going to be, um, we brought in more people to begin to design the structure of the organization based on what hadn't worked before and what we were hoping would work. We took an asset-based approach looking at the community uh, that we would be serving and thinking about how we could enhance what what we had here in the community. Um, and every time we got to a certain point, it was time to bring more people in until finally we got to a place where we very, where the group that I had um, helped me develop a list of the kind of board members that would be needed to support the vision and the mission that we had. And we finally re strategically recruited a board. And it was at the point that we recruited the board that I got to walk off because the board could take it over. But the piece of the story that I want to tell you is that I expanded the leadership four times until we got to the board. And each time it was time to expand the leadership and bring in more people to the group, people that had the expertise that we needed for the next step and who were going to be both serving and served. Um, every time I went to expand the players, I had to remind the people who were already on the team that every time we bring in new people, we're going to be bringing in new ideas and new voices, and it's gonna change our work. You can't expect someone to walk in and just pick up your ball and run with it. They want to know why this ball? Why does it look like this? Why didn't you do that? Um, wouldn't this be better? And our, our work will absolutely, every time we bring more people in, be impacted and will evolve and change to reflect the diverse ideas that are coming in the door. So um, it was hard for me to get people to go along with uh, the reality that we were gonna have to be flexible and willing to expand. But I want to just emphasize that the important thing is that as long as people come in understanding and agreeing that the mission is important, then their contributions to thinking about how do we carry the mission forward um, are valuable. They need to be talked through. Sometimes people with fresh eyes uh, can see things that those of us who are submerged can't. And as long as everybody is completely bought in and invested in the mission, all you can do is better or improve the work that you're doing and you shouldn't be afraid of it. 
It was for, however, uh, I noticed just how much trouble the original advisory group had letting go of control of their original ideas. Um, so the question for me is, is this about us or is it about the mission? But through that work, I learned that that was actually the wrong question. Um, you know, we like to say that this is not about us, it's about the mission. But the truth is the mission requires human beings to carry it out and we are human. And when we get invested in something, it does become about us, right? So it is both about the people and about the mission. Um, the key is to help people to continue to feel that they are being heard and respected. So that even when we ask people to step back a little bit and allow others to come in and share the lead, um, we need to make sure that all views are still understood. And that means, again, making space to have those conversations all over again. Otherwise, if new people come in and they run away with the project, old people will drop off. And we don't want that. We want everybody to be invested. Okay, so um, by the way, this can happen in teams. If a few voices dominate, the rest of the people on your team will tend to uh, disinvest from your work and that's not healthy. Okay, so that was that comment. Um, I want to just address a couple of things that some of you said to me in your final videos, which I always enjoy listening to. Um, two of you mentioned that I asked you to buy the Goldsmith book, but then we barely read from it. And actually, I really appreciate you bringing that to my attention. The reality is that I have tinkered with this class so many times to try to make it more impactful and more powerful in six weeks. And I, I've been, I probably this was the eighth or ninth time I've taught this class and I have adjusted it every single time to make it more impactful in a more efficient way. And I didn't realize how much of Goldsmith I had cut out during the process. So I'm glad somebody said something to me. And now that we're talking about Goldsmith, as long as you have it, let me suggest that you go ahead and read it. The beauty of Goldsmith is that in contrast to Ledwith and Springett, who were both uh, academics, one uh, studying community development and the other studying uh, public health, primarily children's public health. Um, and Frey, who was a grassroots educator and an organizer, Goldsmith is like big time political, a political animal. His views on community development, although also focused on a participatory practice, are much more politically strategic. And so originally these two texts were offered side by side because they help us situate the grassroots effort in its like inescapably political context. Um, some of you will like Goldsmith better than others. Uh, those of you who are more comfortable in a political world will recognize it. Um, and the other thing I want to say is the world has changed quite a bit since Goldsmith wrote this book. Uh, and for that reason, some of it will no longer feel relevant. But honestly, human political behavior is, it may be more intense now, it may be more polarized now, but the psychology and the interaction is a lot the same. Um, and his efforts to center community despite the political are really worth thinking about. So since you have the book, I urge you to go ahead and read it in all your spare time. Um, okay, so while we're talking about other materials, I'd like to share just a few other bits of material with you. First, we didn't do this in this class. And in a way, I wish that I had enough time to do it, even though I feel like the things you have to think about come out in the other readings. And that is simply to start with a definition and a delineation of, of the word community. Um, I do this in an undergraduate course that I teach on communities and inclusion. And it's very, very helpful to begin to pay attention to and be aware about how we decide who is in our community and who is out. It's important at two levels. Uh, one is because obviously we need to know who all of our stakeholders are 
And I think we saw that in particular with the uh, discussion nine and the policing conversation that it's important to bring um, as many stakeholders as are going to be impacted to the table. But the other reason is because internally we have to be aware of the ways we have to we have to we have to be able to recognize the ways that a community might actually be sidelining or marginalizing or even ostracizing its own members. And not only is that oppressive, um, but it's wasteful. We already know that those members that are being ostracized have assets and resources that will benefit the community. So, hey, knock it off and let them in, right? So it's important to be aware of that. My favorite article that really helps us begin to think about who's in and who's out and how how to uh, think about that was written by a guy named Mark Smith in 2001. And um, I, I'm going to leave you a link to it in the uh, in in the text box that this is with. But it's called Community in the I Encyclopedia of Informal Education. And I think actually the title is Community, but it's always with that last tag on it, I'm not sure why. Uh, you can always find that in the library by just Googling Mark Smith and community, but I'm giving you a link in the box. It's online where you don't have to go to the library. Okay, so I wanna address something that your classmate Daniel said in his final video. He said he wished that we'd had the opportunity to compare multiple theories of community development. I think he had that as an expectation for this class. Boy, do I wish I'd had time to do that too. Um, but given that the materials in this class are new to a lot of you and we only have six weeks um, and my goal is like in for big ideas, I have this big goal and that's to facilitate not only some really deep and nuanced readings, but also to help you reflectively integrate these ideas into your mental model so that you understand them as though you had experience using them. And that's hard in a classroom, but that's what I want. And I want your mind, why? Is because I want your mind to you know, automatically be able to pull up these ideas when you are in a situation where they might be called for. Um, I don't know if I've talked to this class about how our minds work and heuristics, but when we enter a situation, whether it's uh, we enter a room where there are people we need to, to address or whether um, we are hearing about a project at work that somebody's doing or whatever, um, our mind does not have time to assess, to collect all the details of, of what is going on around us or what the project parameters are or whatever, and to do a completely fresh, full assessment of whether this is a good thing for us, a bad thing for us, a safe thing, a healthy thing, whatever. In using, believe it or not, this is all what I'm about to say is, uh, it's fascinating and it's all been um, scientifically uh, researched since the 1980s when we started doing MRIs uh, to study brains. You know those those pictures where you see you know two 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 brain slices all lit up and one of them is all you know really really bright and the other one's more calm. Um, one of the things that they studied is um, this this way that our brains work when we encounter these kinds of situations that may be dangerous or may be problematic in some way. And what the scientists, the neuroscientists have learned is that we have a subconscious thing that we do that kind of, I'm, I'm just of course putting it in lay language, not really how it works, but we, um, we go through our catalog of things that we have either experienced or learned somewhere along the way and we match what we've learned to the situation and it's a pretty shallow match. So if you walk up to somebody you're being introduced to and you automatically dislike them, it's because there's something about their mannerism that reminds you of a negative uh, encounter with somebody else along the way. Or if you walk into a, um, if you walk into a meeting and you start hearing how somebody is doing something, even if you haven't done it before, you get this idea that this isn't, this isn't really going to work, but you can't put your finger on it. It's because you've seen some similar thing along the way, or you've heard about or read about some similar thing along the way, and you, it, whatever those memories are in there, 
um, they're raising red flags for you without even knowing why. Uh, this is actually what we mean when we say I had a gut level reaction. We're having a heuristic moment <laughs> when our minds are basically reviewing everything we know and all of our experiences and telling us that it's similar to something else, probably what's responsible for our deja vus too, although I don't know that for a fact. Anyway, I could talk about this for hours because it's a subject of my ethics courses that I give where we talk about um, what intuition is and, and whether or not we can rely on our gut. But um, my, my point is that um, what I want for you in this class is to have this information so integrated into your mental model that when you walk into a situation where this would be an ideal approach, it will come up for you as your brain catalogs what you know and what your options are. It will come up automatically for you. And that will mean that I've added it successfully or you've done the work. So you've added it successfully, but I've facilitated that in this classroom. You've added it to your toolbox in a meaningful and useful way. So that does not actually satisfy Daniel and probably some of the rest of you who still wish that you knew more about other community development theories. I'm pretty sure that if I tried to teach you all of them, uh, none of them would have stuck in your brain, but I certainly agree with Daniel that it's, it's useful to have the other theories, just as we talked about the use of many theories in our theory unit. Um, yes, it's important. So in a nutshell, the existing theories out there uh, tend to look at people, power, or institutional structure. Uh, sometimes there are other principles uh, such as leadership. Um, what I have giving you a link to in the text is somebody, I don't remember who, very uh, fortuitously put together a brief slideshow that goes over uh, seven of the best known community development theories that are out there. Um, and as we discovered in our theory building unit, you will find times when some of these theories may be more fitting than the ones that we studied and as such be more useful. And uh, to the extent that you are interested, like Daniel is, I urge you to uh, take the names of these theories as you see them in the slideshow and go ahead and look them up in Google Scholar and see what they're all about. All right, and last but not least, because I'm already like close to a half an hour here, 22 minutes, um, I'm just gonna rattle off some other texts and I will put their names also in the text box below. Um, one of my very favorite articles is by a guy named Checkaway, and it's all the way back from 1987, and it's called Six Empowerment Strategies for Low-Income Communities. And I like it because they're immediately useful tools. Uh, you can find many other articles by Checkaway. I like him as an author and someone who's studied um, community, and he's got good stuff. So if you like that article, look him up. Um, all right, and then there's one by a person named Tamis, and it's called System Theory and Community Development. I'm all about system theory, and I think this is a great article to help you think about how systems are at work in communities, just to have in the back of your mind, back there with those heuristic things. Um, and finally, there's a workbook that was actually created by the Vitalist Foundation here in Phoenix, and it's called Creating Resilient Communities, a workbook. So those are my recommendations to you. Again, thank you so very much for your tolerance this semester. Thank you for letting me participate in the background in the grade book. Thank you to those of you who came to me to talk anything out at all. Um, nobody came to me, well, okay, not nobody, but almost nobody came to me because they were in trouble and needed help. And those of you who did come were because you wanted to grow and learn more and that just thrills me so it's been wonderful i'm going to also leave you my facebook link i am not a big twitter person i'm not on instagram well i'm there but i don't post anything uh, but i do talk about these issues quite a bit if you happen to be female i also run a or I guess I should use the word woman now, whether whether born that way or self-gendered that way. I um, I have created a, a group called Woman Up. Uh, we created it last year and um, it's 
it's a woman's environment. It's very different in there. So if that's something that interests you, uh, after you friend me on Facebook, just ask me and I'll invite you. Um, that's it. I really, uh, this is my last official class as a full-time faculty at ASU, and it's been a fabulous uh, going out experience for me, and I attribute that all to how dedicated and amazing learners and teachers you have all been. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your summer.